So up next is our first panel discussion, fermentation as the ultimate sustainability solution. Have you been hearing terms like upcycled, zero waste, and land free? Well, in this session, you'll learn how companies are using fermentation to create some of the most sustainable products on the planet by focusing on inputs and processes that leave a light footprint. Stacy Pyatt, the program manager of Proteins for Life at Wageningen University and Research, will be our moderator. Welcome to Stacy and our panelists. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Caroline. And I just want to compliment whoever has been training the GFI people to say Wageningen because that's not an easy word for everybody and you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> um, so really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be here. I think it's going to be um, a fantastic panel. We've got a really great collection of contributors. Um, and I'm just going to walk through them quickly. If you'll just give a wave when I say your name and your company, and we'll come back and do a little bit longer introductions in a moment. Um, so we have Jim Laird, who is the founder of 3F Bio, mentioned in the, in the previous presentation by Nate. Um, Lisa Dyson, CEO of Air Protein. Great to have you here, Lisa. Greg Belt, Global VP of Sustainability and Value Creation at AB InBev. And my colleague, Jeroen Hugenholz, an all-round scientist and microbe expert. So thanks all of you for joining. I'm uh, really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, and Greg, I wanted to toss over to you first, if you would sort of introduce us to AB and InBev and uh, what your up to in sort of broad lines related to fermentation. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Stacey. Not, nice to meet you formally. Um, and uh, thanks to GFI for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. Um, so uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev is the world's largest uh, brewer um, with over 250 breweries uh, worldwide, um, produces great uh, beers like um, uh, Budweiser, Stella Artois, uh, Leff, and uh, Corona. Uh, my role at uh, ABI is to, um, um, to explore um, and leverage our existing assets and capabilities uh, for the purposes of sustainability to solve uh, the world problems. Uh, so that's, um, that's a little bit about me and about AB. Great. Thanks so much. And I think for just to refer back for the audience to uh, those sort of categories of fermentation that Liz was referring to earlier, um, Greg is going to talk to us about a traditional fermentation process that results in a side stream that is, um, you know, providing really interesting functional proteins that are going into to some plant-based products today. Um, so great to have you here sort of representing that category too. Um, so Jim, could I toss over to you for the next introduction? Tell us a little bit, bit about yourself and about 3F Bio. Yeah, thanks Stacey and thanks GFI. Um, so where Greg was traditional, I'm, I'm the biomass uh, part of this panel. Um, and our collective purpose at 3F Bio is making protein sustainable. Uh, and by doing so, we, we want to make a positive impact on the environment, also nutrition. Um, so we grow microprotein using any fermentable sugar uh, with a patented zero waste process, which as Nate has just explained, integrates into a bioethanol refinery. Um, we will only make an impact on nutrition and on, on the environment if we we make great food that consumers love, and therefore we address this by growing microprotein, which is an existing advantaged ingredient with an established market role, and doing so more sustainably at a lower cost than any other protein option. Um, so delighted that Nate summarized it. We are at an exciting stage of the process and I'm about to invest in our lar lar first large scale production plant. Yeah, it is really an exciting moment. So we're extra grateful that you were able to take an hour out to spend with us on this panel, Jim. Thanks so much for that. Um, Lisa, I was actually wondering if you were going to categorize yourself at, under the biomass fermentation category or the precision fermentation category. Um, but tell us yourself. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so wonderful to be here. Thanks, Stacey and the BFI team for inviting me. Um, so at Air Protein, we do something that we sometimes call reverse fermentation or reverse brewing. And that's because CO2 is a byproduct of fermentation. And so it comes out of the process. We actually use CO2 as an input to our process. Uh, and we're able to make really nutritious proteins that have all the essential amino acids uh, and are rich in everything from bioavailable uh, minerals to vitamins. And so we're, we're really focused on taking that 
some novel production of protein, that novel process, and making proteins in the most sustainable way. In fact, the greenhouse gas footprint of our proteins are negative. Uh, so it's a way of, way of really uh, taking the sustainability to the next level. Uh, and then we're really focused on making meat analogs as our initial uh, application of these nutritious proteins. Fantastic. Thanks. And Yarun, last but not least, if you don't mind introducing yourself and what you do in that Yeah. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, my name is Jeroen Hugenholtz. Um, I uh, work at the Applied Research Center here uh, on the campus in Wageningen called Wageningen Food and Biobased Research. And I lead a fermentation group within this uh, Applied Research Center. And basically what we do is uh, convert cheap waste streams into high value components uh, using fermentation for both uh, non-food and food applications. And basically uh, relevant for this uh, uh, for this hour is the focus on produ producing all kinds of food ingredients using uh, fermentation, like uh, vitamins and natural flavors and antimicrobials and microbial oils. And uh, well, they will come up in the discussion later on. Great, thank you. So I think we um, we had a couple of shout outs to it already, um, but basically one of the main things we want to tackle in this panel is talking about sustainability. Um, and I just want to start out by acknowledging that sustainability is still a kind of a big umbrella and tends to be a kind of vague concept. I've heard people say, you know, show me the source, I'll tell you why it's sustainable. And that's really, I think, because there are so many different aspects to it, right? It can be about land use, it can be about greenhouse gas emissions, it can be about water use, um, you know, can be about positioning inside of the system. Um, so I'd just like to walk through from each of you, um, when you look at fermentation and from your perspective, the piece of ferment fermentation that you're particularly working with, what do you think are the real benefits we can achieve using fermentation in the context of, of, of protein conversion and pr production? Um, and how does that relate into these different factors uh, under the sustainability umbrella? And um, Greg, maybe I'll start by, by kicking off to you. You can talk about how, how converting spent, spent brewer's grain is contributing to the sustainability within ABN VIP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so I just mentioned briefly, we're, we're, we're focused, ABI is, is a big company with a lot of assets and we're focusing on how we can leverage those assets to solve world problems. And we've got two kind of big ideas. The one is, is fermentation and, and utilizing uh, excess fermentation capacity. So ABI has hundreds of millions of hectoliters of, of capacity, of fermentation capacity. And uh, beer is uh, very uh, cyclical. Consumers enjoy beer uh, largely in, in the summertime. And uh, what it can mean to a brewery is that in the winter months, they could be at 30 or 70 percent um, have available fermentation capacity. Okay. So we're looking at how do we util utilize that fermentation capacity, that large scale uh, fermenters uh, to produce uh, to produce ingredients. And um, and some of the our hypothesis, some of the numbers that we have seen is that, you know, one simple uh, 5,000 hectoliter fermentation tank can 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 produce uh, protein that's equivalent to about 5,000 cows. So when we, we see numbers like that, we get super, super excited. Um, and I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this who would love to have your problem. <laughs> All that yeah, yeah. So and, and, and a big part of what we're doing is, is Stacey, is, is reaching out to these entrepreneurs and reaching out to start up, the startups. Um, and leveraging the technologies. One of the things that we did on our, 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 our spent grain, so just a, a quick intro to spent grain or, or barley. Barley comes into our brewery and, uh, and then uh, what the brewer does is they gently heat that, that barley and remove the starch. And then what's left over is called a brewer's spent grain. And the spent is like a, a misnomer. It's actually a great source of nutrition, it contains 30% uh, uh, protein, 50% fiber. And, uh, and today it's largely sold as, as animal feed uh, to dairy farms. And so what we're looking at is uh, repurposing that nutrition um, into, uh, into uh, ingredients, uh, protein flours, protein and fiber flours and, uh, and isolates. 
And how are you, I mean, what sort of metrics are you tracking when you're, when you're looking at um, sustainability for the company overall or in the specific context of how you're making choices um, with regard to your, to your spent grain, your not spent spent grain? <laughs> yeah, the not, not, not spent grain. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really a couple different things. Number one is we're looking at it, as, as you mentioned, sustainability is, 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 can be a complex target, a topic, and you, you want to look at um, sustainability across a number of different metrics. And what we have seen is that, number one, I think, I think everyone would agree, or most people would agree, that the world needs additional sources of plant protein. So if we can bring barley protein to the market directly to the consumer at scale, um, then that gives consumers, uh, you know, more options. We can make a better plant-based milk or better beverages uh, or better meat alternatives. And, um, and, uh, and ultimately that should reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gas, gas emissions. Um, and we can do that with land that's already being used uh, for, to grow barley for, for beer. So we can do that with minimal additional like land usage and things like that. So we look at it, Stacy, across a number of different metrics, uh, but focusing again on 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 uh, on uh, largely ghg but also land use and nutrition and impacting the consumer thanks just um caroline just asked me um she wanted to make sure she understood it right Five thousand cows is that right uh <laughs> yes our hypothesis so again so the scale of which we're talking about here is amazing but abi has hundreds of millions of of fermentation capacity uh, of which a, sub, a portion of that is uh, available in the winter months. And, um, and one 5,000 hectoliter tank um, can produce as much protein as 5,000 as 5, cows. That's yeah. our hypothesis. Well, cool. Exciting, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. Jim, um, your technology is sort of integrating a... a, a bioethanol refinery and food protein production in a really unique way. And I know you're focusing on zero waste, stop upcycling waste. We can we can actually integrate ourselves to have zero waste, waste which is really cool. Um, is there any piece of what you're doing that sort of triggers into that the debate about what should we be using for food? What should we be using for fuel? And how does that sort of um, work into your zero waste system? And then the second part of the question, if you could also address how you're looking at sustainability, what are your metrics and what are the benefits of, of the technology you've developed? Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I love the message, let's start with sustainability. Um, and for me, the killer metric that means fermentation beats every other option to make food protein is, is really the efficiency and feed conversion. Um, I think Greg's got my head spinning on a number of cows and within our facility, we will be making a, a single fermenter. And if I do the, the crude mass, I think it's 50,000 cows per fermenter, um, which you come back to feed conversion ratios. It's, it's That's where we win. And I think your, your core question is about, are we using resources efficiently? Um, and, it, and it's that feed conversion of, of less than a ton of glucose in makes more than a ton of wet protein, which compared to the animal, uh, everything beats the animal. Um, so I guess to explain what we do, we convert any fermentable sugar source into a whole food using large scale fermenters. Um, and we can do it with grains such as wheat and maize or also starch sources such as rice, cassava, uh, or wider into sugar cane. Um, so you, you, I think you've prompted, we've got IP that lets us do this efficiently because any of the feedstock we don't use we to make food is fully recovered into the zero waste process by passing it back to the biorefinery for making biofuels. Um, I guess I should expand. It's a room full of fermentation scientists. So to expand on this, our organism needs to have an excess of nutrients. And if it were in a standalone pr process, we'd naturally have some, some form of waste because that excess would form waste. Um, in our process, that waste is fully recovered because any non-fermented sugars are then converted to fuel um, along, um, and then any, any non-recovered protein gets added back into the biorefinery and creates animal feed. So that's, that's the essence of zero waste um, and as you say we can measure this sustainability measure number number in a number of ways i think cows might be the new metric um, but for me it's feed conversion and really low water usage that mean producing microprotein is good for the environment but also also ultimately it's low cost and 
if it wasn't low cost, it doesn't get high scale and doesn't get high impact. So I think every alternative protein option beats the animal in terms of its environmental metrics. But I, I guess it's absolutely important that we that we make something that consumers love. Otherwise, we don't we don't get high kilograms, high tons of conversion. And we therefore don't get that ultimate benefit. Yeah, absolutely. If you can make a combination of low cost and high consumer value, you've definitely sort of hit the sweet spot. Yeah, no doubt. Great. Thank you, Jim. So um, Lisa, you're using fermentation to actually convert components of air, carbon dioxide and oxygen into protein. Um, what makes that such an efficient system? And tell us a little bit more about your, I think you said it's actually a carbon negative process. And that's fascinating. So tell us how you achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. From, we call it cradle to plate. Oh, it's, are you, yes, thanks. We call it, uh, you know, from cradle to plate, it's carbon negative. Um, so that is something that we're, we're excited about with our process. Uh, and we're really focused on the future of meat. Um, with our technology. So going back to the cow example, uh, it would take, uh, you know, two years plus to make a steak and use a lot of land, a lot of resources, a lot of water along the way. And in order to make a steak with our process, it's just four days. And that's from, again, cradle to plate. That's from CO2 in to product out. Uh, and the amount of land that you use is significantly reduced. The amount of water is significantly reduced. And just to make a comparison with, with soy, actually, uh, so it would take a soy farm the size of, of Texas to give you the same amount of protein that you get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. Uh, so that's the land utilization reduction. And then from water utilization, it's about 2,000 times less water versus soy protein. Uh, so we're excited about the sustainability aspects of you know, what we, we sometimes call reverse fermentation. Yeah, cool. I, I think we're introducing all kinds of awesome new metrics today, cows and Disney World. <laughs> I, I love that from this panel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Yeroon, because you're sort of in an academic setting, I know you, you're working quite broadly on different sort of feedstocks and different organisms. Um, and I thought that I would just toss to you to ask, um, you know, we've had sort of three different pieces of the fermentation puzzle represented here. Um, apart from those three, what are sort of what things are, are really fascinating or compelling in terms of their their potential for use in the food industry and to contribute to a sustainable portfolio of proteins? Uh, well, uh, uh, well, thank you for the question, uh, Stacy. Uh, as I explained uh, a few minutes ago, um, we are involved in using fermentation for production of all kinds of uh, food ingredients. So there we basically convert as cheap as possible waste streams using selected organisms and producing uh, uh, ingredients um, that are now currently produced uh, in more chemical ways. And uh, examples are uh, vitamins, flavors, uh, antimicrobials. Um, we see uh, lots of possibilities also for production of microbial oils as a replacement for palm oil. Um, low calorie sweeteners like erythritol and triolose. Um, these are all processes where fermentation can play uh, a crucial role. Questions uh, or uh, let's say demands in this uh, sector are growing. So we see an expansion of the whole fermentation technology in this sense. And what is I think interesting uh, also for this panel is that uh, in producing these uh, different ingredients using fermentation, you also get a lot of biomass being formed. And this biomass will contain 50% or more protein. And most of these proteins are very useful uh, in food and feed uh, applications. And if we can, uh, if we take, for instance, acetic acid, if of course, which is massively produced using fermentation. If you look worldwide, the amount of uh, acetic acid which is produced by fermentation, we calculated that about 10 million metric tons of protein are produced annually. So I don't know how many um, Disney worlds and cows this accounts for, but uh, it's a lot. Right? Bioethanol is of course even bigger, but processes like citric acids, also a few million, uh, metric tons of protein produced annually in protein. 
And then you have lactic acid. You have various vitamins, like vitamin C is, a, of course, a process where it also involves, at least part of it, is a fermentation process where a, a acetic acid bacteria or a gluconobacter is used. And also their biomass is being formed. And these uh, biomass sources are growing because the amount of fermentations is growing. So this is going to be a huge source of proteins um, which are available. And if you talk about sustainability, you want to use them and you don't want to throw them away. So I see uh, tremendous options there and this is going to grow. Do you know what's what's happening to those uh, to that biomass today? Well, basically, uh, uh, some of this biomass is, of course, uh, part of the original substrate, which is then uh, not completely uh, fermented, or there is uh, sediment, and uh, part of this sediment it will also end up uh, in uh, in feed uh, as a, a very cheap uh, feed uh, uh, additive. But some of it will be burned. Some of it will be. Uh, uh, combined uh, in soil, um, but these are all quite low value applications uh, that are currently being used. And definitely the potential is underutilized tremendously at the moment. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. We'll uh, have to get back to everybody about how many cows that equal. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, thanks all of you uh, for that. Um, I'd like to kind of switch gears and, and move on to um, basically to to the topic of bottlenecks. Um, and I think, you know, just to put them into broad categories, we know that any new protein source uh, can run up against bottlenecks, first of all, in the business case, you know, how can we produce this at, a, at, at cost and how much technology development do we need to be able to get to something um, that is compelling within the limits of, of what what we can um, can sell for food. Um, also technological bottlenecks, so just really about the, the nitty gritty of upscaling, just being able to, um, to produce at large scale. Regulatory bottlenecks, definitely sort of a relevant issue um, in some of our fermentative solutions. And of course, bottlenecks related to, to consumer adoption, those um, sort of familiarity aspects. Um, so I wanted to kind of to look through the lens of those bottlenecks that um, what each of you are doing and, and hear from you sort of how you're working to overcome the specific bottlenecks in this domain. Lisa, I wanted to ask you if you could speak first on the issue of sort of business cases, um, being a successful entrepreneur, if you could talk through how you worked to develop your business case and how you came up with a sort of compelling um, compelling business case that motivated investment in your in your company. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so for us, you know, once you've made this protein and with our company, we're really focused on sustainability as people are in this room, uh, you know, that's sort of core what we're offering. And then the next question was, where's the opportunity? And what we, we see is that there's a huge opportunity specifically in the meat sector. Um, you know, it's a $1.4 trillion market and COVID has actually accelerated the, the opportunities for alternative meats. You know, we saw the Essential, essentially the collapse of the meat industry uh, with thousands, in some cases, of cases at these different facilities in many geographies in the U.S. and in Canada and Germany and Brazil. Uh, and in, in, at the same time, concurrent with that, you know, consumers are at home more, they're looking at, you know, they're, they're reading more, they're focused on nutrition more. And we've seen this, this, this uh, increased demand and interest in alternative meat. And so for a company that's really looking to deliver uh, something into the marketplace, really bringing their sustainable solution to market. You know, the, what we've done is we've really focused on the, the the demand and the need, and kind of that that trying to filling fill that sweet spot. And one of the main reasons why consumers switch from from traditional meat, we'll call it, to alternative meat, uh, is for sustainability reasons. We have the whole flexitarian movement. Uh, a significant fraction, I think 40% of millennials claim to have a flexitarian diet. So they're looking for alternatives. Uh, and then nutrition. When my 80 plus year old aunt told me that she was no longer eating meat, I almost fell out of my chair. We're all from, you know, her family's from Louisiana, my mom's family's from Louisiana. And, you know, meat was an integral part of every meal, but it was really for, for health reasons and, and nutrition reasons. And that's one of the things that we focus on as well at Air Protein. We see a huge demand for 
nutritious, delicious alternatives to meat that are very sustainable. And so it's just really focusing on that demand uh, and really delivering consumers to consumers what they're what they're looking for. How are you um, How are you anticipating on the price positioning of of meat analogs into the in the coming years? I know there's there are sort of rumors and talks and occasional sort of fears popping up of a price war in the meat analogs domain. You know, I personally I think it would be a great thing if we could make them more cost accessible to consumers. But I'm wondering, sort of how does that um, how does that track with a business case? looking looking to capture a piece of that market right now? And that's a great question. For, for us early on, before even venturing into this space, we did a techno-economic assessment and we looked at if we were able to, you know, to scale and when we scale our technology, what do the economics look like? And if you look at our protein ingredient, that's kind of a core piece. You know, the, the economics are very favorable. Uh, and our ultimate goal is to be able to deliver low-cost nutrition really across the globe to you know, many different price points, many different products, offerings. Uh, so you know, we're specifically focused on economics and sustainability and nutrition first, and then build the business after we believe that we had a good value proposition. Great, I think that's, that's good advice also for aspiring entrepreneurs <laughs> listening, uh, listening to the panel today. Thanks. Um, so on to sort of another bottleneck, uh, Jim, I thought it would be interesting to hear from you if you would talk us through your technology development process. I know, you know, Vakningen was involved in part of it, but I think we are by far not the only knowledge partner that you've leveraged. You've really sort of set up a kind of global network um, of, of partners helping you sort of develop and, and take this further. Um, so maybe you can share with us what are the key success factors that, that you took along um, in doing so. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I absolutely echo uh, Lisa's point that, you know, if we don't get a consumer at the start and also don't get regulatory at the start, then actually your techno technology is irrelevant. So uh, I think I'm almost parking the fact that you have to have something that's delicious and you have to have something that is not overly confrontational for the regulator, because if, if you are, then I think those are hard to, those are hard obstacles to get over. Um, and, and therefore, in terms of your question it was about technology, uh, and maybe just to explain our plan, we we aim to have our first facility making 10,000 tons per year, operational in 22, and it's going to be uh, in your back door in the Netherlands. Um, and, and that first plant, and Nate said it earlier, is supported by a, a plenitude flagship project um, for 17 million euros, and it's grant funding from the EU's bio-based industries. And I have to say, we are immensely grateful to them. Um, and I think it exemplifies leadership in terms of driving this ecosystem. Um, so within that plenitude, it, it brings together that full value chain and, and that's massively important. And I think it epitomizes collaboration. And, and within that, I think it's, it's got yourself as Wagningen, IFF, ABP, Mosa, Vavera, Lactips, Bridge to Food and, LC and LCE, and that whole, that whole ecosystem is massively important. And within being able to prevail in, in terms of some of the things we're doing, I think engaging that the external collaboration and not, uh, it, it was vital. Um, so we recognize that we are a small company. Uh, we're working with a consortium of really world leading experts. And as a co coordinator of that project, a real privileged role. Um, so I think you, you, your question is, what's the success factors? And for me, I'll, I'll call out three. Um, I think firstly, only follow that path of being an entrepreneur if you fully believe in and are clear on your purpose and what your purpose is. And for us, our purpose is making the most sustainable food protein to have that impact at scale. Um, and building that, you know, the development path is never going to run smoothly. I think we all know that. Um, and when those obstacles happen, you, I think you only overcome them by working in that collaborative manner. So collaborate with the best possible partners you can. And uh, we're delighted to be working with such a great consortium. Um, and maybe the final one for me is keep in mind your long-term goals. Uh, so our plan in that first site is growing from 10,000 tons to 50,000 tons by 2027. Um, but for me, the really and you know the big numbers, but the really inspiring fact, or the fact that makes us want to run faster every day, is that even though even though these numbers are big, fifty thousand tons accounts for an absolute fraction of what of the demand that's needed. Um, if we believe any of the UBS, AT, Kearney, Rethink X type numbers, um, we're accounting for two percent of the 
increase in demand in, in non-animal protein. So being clear on your long-term goals and keeping that driving you I think is important. Um, and for me, our long-term target is beyond that, is a million tons within 10 years. Uh, and from what we see, the, for, and I think that's why I celebrate GFI's uh, conference today, there's no competing non-animal protein source that is anywhere on track to achieve that scale within that time scale. So um, that's what drives us. And um, yeah, I think work with great people and uh, keep in mind your, your, end, your end goal. Yeah, I think it's great that you put that into perspective. Um, you can at once have really ambitious uh, targets for your own organization and still also just be a drop in the bucket. And that's also a great argument for why, you know, why we need to be open with each other like yeah. the rising tide lifts all ships kind of collaboration in this space, right? There's so much, so much potential to capture. We're, you know, we're not competing with each other. We're sort of competing with the traditional sources. Thanks, Jen. Um, right, so over to Yurun. Um, maybe we can pick up the that piece of regulatory. We've had it called out a couple of times. Um, Obviously, you know, if we look into the microbes, there's sort of a world to choose from of bugs. There are far more of them than there are of us on this planet, um, yet only kind of a handful which are already sort of established as potential food sources. Can you speak to, you know, what's available in the short term and what's interesting in the long term in the context of, of what kind of regulatory approval um, is there and what might be gotten in the coming years? Um, yes, um, of course, um, we work with uh, a couple of uh, organisms. Uh, I just a few minutes ago shared a list of ingredients that we produce using fermentations. And these are all different organisms, but these are all organisms that are what we call food grade. So they have been isolated from existing fermented products. So we have not introduced any kind of uh, new uh, microorganisms. And um, so in, in that respect, um, we are basically following legislation. But there is a, a, not only an aspect of the other organisms that we might want to use, but there is this aspect of using novel substrates that these organisms have never seen before. And that's what we do when we are converting different kind of waste streams, side streams from the food industry, maybe from other industry. And we are using fermentation. We get a combination of a substrate and an organism that is not existing um, in nature. And in that case, uh, at least in Europe, uh, we will have to deal with uh, novel food legislation to get this through. So that is an, uh, that's sort of a challenge. Uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, come over or that we need to deal with, uh, basically, uh, uh, when we are developing these processes together with uh, industrial partners. But that's something that we uh, need to realize. Um, but even with all the existing organisms, uh, we are still uh, need to take legislative um, hurdles. Huh? Uh, one, another hurdle is basically the use of waste streams. Uh, are we allowed to use waste streams for uh, an, uh, eventually a food application? Those are other hurdles that need to be uh, tackled uh, before we can really leverage this uh, fermentation in the best way. Yeah, I think the last two questions also sort of bring to me one of the things that I sometimes ponder, the, the best and worst of being in Europe you know, the ecosystems and the opportunity for a subsidy are fantastic and the regulatory <laughs> is a little bit strict. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, Greg, last question of, of the panel and then we'll get to some questions from uh, from the listeners. Um, I, sure. I understood that there's actually, there are already a couple of, uh, of, of barley milks launched on the market using your spent brewer's grain, your non-spent mm -hmm. spent brewer's grain. Um, I'm actually curious how you're presenting it to the consumer and what kind of consumer responses you're getting to this as a new protein source. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a great question, Stacy. Like in, in short, we haven't figured it out completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the harsh <laughs> the harsh reality. 
Um, what we have seen, uh, what I can, what I can tell you, what we've learned, what we've seen is the consumer is oftentimes confused by words like upcycled, uh, rejuvenated, repurposed. Um, even simple things like uh, sometimes GHG emissions or carbon, you know, many consumers uh, don't don't understand. And so um, I think one of the quick learnings there is it, whatever whatever that story is needs to be told succinctly and and, and very, very simple um, on on the packaging. And some of it will come down to the brand uh, and the, the brand's identity and uh, and its target consumer. Uh, but um, but um, but some of the, some of the things there. It's just a very complex, a very complex situation. Um, some of our other uh, uh, learnings have been on um, um, uh, telling the telling the story, just like completely transparency and, and complete transparency. So um, 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 consumers, one issue that consumers have identified with is food waste. Um, in addition to like plastic, uh, ocean plastic and things like that. Those are the, in our research, those are the two big items uh, or two big topics that consumers do identify with and, and do have and have some, uh, some base knowledge on. And so going back to that transparency, how you tell your story from a brand perspective um, succinctly and clearly without too much, too much like technical jargon, so to speak, uh, is really, really important. But once that story is understood, um, we have seen that consumers are very, very loyal uh, to those to those brands or to those companies or to those products. So it's sort of like once you crack the code, it, it has a huge, huge impact. Um, but um, but it is complex, and um, and it really you need almost a brand or a product specific approach. Yeah, yeah. And some things that that you might think would obviously work, like this is a very sustainable product or has low greenhouse gas emissions, are in fact, too complicated. Yeah, I think that's a good wisdom for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've got some some questions from the audience, and I think uh, Lisa, the first question is for you. I think you you've really sort of captured people's um, fascination with the concept of converting um, basically air into protein. So can you briefly describe how that process works? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's like fermentation, and that's why we sometimes call it reverse fermentation. So you have your fermentation vessel, you have your culture. These cultures actually consume CO2. That's the difference. Uh, other cultures that people are used to working with actually produce CO2. So we actually bubble CO2 into the fermentation vessel. The microorganisms consume that CO2, and then they're able to make protein. And then we're able to use that protein to make the meat analogs uh, and you know, work on reinventing the future of meat. Is there, um, and I, I think this connects also to the second question that we got in, um, are there benefits or in fact, what are the specific benefits compared to a traditional fermentation that uses sugar as an input um, using, basically using carbon or carbon dioxide or air? Yeah, that's a good question. And so a sugar fermentation process also uses CO2 as, as an input, but the CO2 goes into the sugar. So in that case, you still need land, you still need resources. And this is sort of the, the, the next step, shall we say, sort of skipping that sugar step, that growth process, so that you take that CO2 and go directly into the culture. Uh, so this skips a step, essentially. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so I think the next question is a little bit more general. Um, and I think I'll, I'll ask it first to Greg, and then we'll, we'll see if we have time for, for someone else to jump in. Um, so it's actually how, uh, in general, about the innovation process, um, how can we sort of shorten the distance between companies and research institutes or universities to promote innovation or to accelerate the pace of innovation? Um, so Greg, um, may I toss this one to you? Ask yeah, you to yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think on the journey, so we've been working on this for, for several years, since, since 2013. And um, and uh, what we have clearly seen is that like not one company can do it all and um, and that a partnership approach uh, across um, startups, big companies like ABI uh, and universities is what's needed to, to ultimately get to success and get through that innovation, um, that innovation um, learning curve. 
Um, so like basic research uh, that the universities do, whether it's Wageningen or uh, we uh, are also working with the University of Cork in Ireland. Um, um, and, and really that's helped us accelerate like that particularly early on in the innovation process. Um, and then what we have found is just a bunch of fantastic, amazing startups anywhere from four people to, to 20 people working on really interesting technologies that offer a shortcut. Um, sure, could AB invest and in, 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 in probably replicate that technology? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that these startups have it and, 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 and we, and we uh, utilize it and work together on it, and then you can use ABI to scale it. So taking that technology, basic research, that technology that startups are working on, and then the scaling for big companies like ABI, I think is, is sort of like the, the, the soup to make a successful, a, a successful innovation. Um, and uh, looking at like, you know, those three ingredients or those three types of partners. Yeah, I think there's, there's no better argument for why ecosystems and platforms and meetings like this are so incredibly important is that, you know, when you pull those together, then you, you really, really can achieve uh, the impact that we all want to achieve. Yeah, we'll just go so much faster than yeah. trying to do it and then everyone trying to do it themselves. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer question number four myself and very briefly because there was a question on how to address novel food uh, legislation in the EU. And I'm just going to answer that one to say with patience. <laughs> if you, if you're interested, you can contact me. We're involved in a, in a few um, dossier submissions um, for, for food safety approval. Um, and we know when we start that, that it's going to be a two to three year process and that it's going to be put on hold a number of times because they think of a, a new question that they have for us. Um, but it's doable. You know, it just requires time. Uh, and that's you know, that's the key ingredient there. Um, so let me ask this next question to Jim. And I'm conscious that we are we are short on time. Um, so we'll just take maybe one or one or two more. Um, Jim, when you're using um, side streams, waste streams, or you know non-traditional streams, um, is contamination of the cultures a problem when you're when you're scaling up? And if so, how do you overcome that? Yeah, I think um, it's it's the right question. I think as a food industry, our first obligation is is safety. Next obligation is deliciousness, and so therefore, in everything we do, and you know, we we just talked about regulatory there. Regulatory is there for a reason, and I think we um, can. I hear your challenge on it, but we have to respect it, and, it, and it's got a value. So, making sure it's safe is is absolutely right. Um, uh, I I was thinking about something earlier. I one of my past lives, I ran a crisp factory, and crisp factories come with dirty potatoes at the back door and clean <laughs> crisps at the front door. And um, you know, so contamination comes in, and there's ways of making sure that what you end up with is wholly safe, wholly delicious, wholly nutritious. Um, and, and I think it's about your process design and it's about controls, um, which are absolutely re required. And, they, and the, then once you're confident of those controls, it's about the, your dossiers, your, um, your technical compliance, your quality management system that ensures that the dirty potato ends up as a, as a, as a great tasting crisp. I recognize crisp as a, a chip in the US. Um. <laughs> potato chips. <Yeah. laughs> we understood you. <laughs> Um, so I think there's just one last question, and I would just like to toss this to all of you, but then then very briefly, uh, and we'll round off with that, because this last question is um, really, I think, a fair one and one that every protein source needs to be held to. How can we compete with soy? I mean, soybeans are incredibly cheap. They contain high protein. Um, this... I mean, the writer of this question says they don't know any fermentation process which can make biomass below uh, $2 per kilogram. So I think question to each of you, you know, in concrete terms, when and how do you think you can compete on the, that cost pressure coming from soy? And I don't know who, who, who's brave enough to take the question first. I'll just ask you all to answer it super quickly. Okay, shall I go first? Sure. I mean, some of the examples that I presented uh, where basically the protein can be a side stream. These are tremendous amounts of uh, protein that can be used. And um, I uh, 
expect that if you do the business case calculation that you can come uh, uh, close to the uh, price that is uh, available for soy. Uh, but you need to have a completely different focus uh, uh, on your process and legislation will have to help as well. Yeah, fair point. It's about whether we can get the job done on downstream processing and converting it to something delicious, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who else? I'll go bolder. I think, I mean, and I'm going to plagiarize the GFI line, and you know, we have to make products that taste as good as and cost not more than the animal. And and when can we do that? We we do that today. Uh, I think ferment. That's what fermentation gives us. And come back to your earlier question, the resource convert the feed conversion for fermentation means that we beat the animal and we compete with all of those plant options which have got inefficiencies in supply chain and logistics and other aspects of their story so uh your question is when and i think the answer is now and um and it has to be now because uh there's just this huge demand but i, I think the fundamental efficiency and resource efficiency in fermentation is today uh, but can we can we be cheaper than soy we can be cheaper than the animal so i guess you know soy soy pro, soy is a cheap bean by the time it's a concentrate or a flower and it's been micro extruded or, or thermally extruded to give it texture it's it's quite an expensive product um so can we make products which taste as good as animal and cost less than animal and are delicious nutritious yes we can and i think that's if we can't then then we better run faster um, that's fair okay very quick word uh lisa yeah, just to piggyback on what Jim's saying, our approach is to really minimize and get rid of a lot of those inefficiencies. And so our production process is landless. There's no there's no arable land required, not even for the inputs, because the inputs are uh, CO2, and then you need a, a, an electricity essentially source to generate hydrogen. Uh, and then beyond that, we're able to make a really, really nutritious and, and dense protein, this 80% protein to start, whereas as Jim was saying, you, you start with a much lower protein content with soy, and then you have to concentrate and do other things to get it to a, uh, this refined product that's ready for uh, ingredient in, in different products. And so we're, we're happy to be a part of the companies that are really getting rid of those inefficiencies and focusing on a streamlined production process. In our case, it's landless and then has, you know, amazing sustainability metrics. Yeah, fair point. Yeah. Greg, do you... Um... Do you want to, in a 30 second, I'm conscious of being yeah. over time. Yep, yeah, I, I think just supporting Jim's point, I think that I'm not sure we need to be as, as competitive as, as soy, um, but um, leveraging existing fermentation capacity might be one, one route there, right? So at scale, and scale mm -hmm. means a big thing in this type of industry. So I think that that's uh, an additional untapped opportunity. And we've heard you've got a lot of extra capacity. Yes, <laughs> that one I'm going to remember. <laughs> Great. Well, I just want to um, thank you all again so much for being here. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope that the, that the audience did too. Thanks so much for your time, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you so much to Stacy and our panelists for that really engaging discussion. Those are some staggering statistics on the efficiency of fermentation and also land use reduction. I started chatting with uh, Greg backstage because I just couldn't wrap my head around um, his line about one of their tanks, um, I think being equal to 5,000 uh, cows. So he, he, we actually did the math. Um, he said that with their capacity, they have the ability to create the protein equal to approximately 400 million cows. And that's just one company. And to put that in context, globally, 300 million cows are slaughtered each year. So you can see um, the ability to displace that's pretty incredible. Some other things that really caught my attention, right? It's, it's, it's still hard to wrap my head around the fact that we can actually produce protein from the components of air. Really exciting work being done there. Um, and just how cool that we can produce alternative meats from the side streams of beer production. So um, lots of exciting things um, there around the sustainability benefits um, and, and really cool to learn about the innovative work being done. And we didn't get to talk too much about it, but thinking about how companies can really use these ingredients to help meet their ESG goals. 
So next up, we have GFI's Dr. Liz Specht moderating a panel discussion on scaling up the production of ingredients produced through fermentation to meet the rapidly growing demand. You'll learn how incumbents with massive fermentation capacity might be the ideal candidates for scaling or joint venture partnership, partnerships with some of the emerging fermentation companies targeting this industry. So please stay tuned while we momentarily stop broadcasting as we get our next group ready for the stage. We'll be back in just one minute. <laughs> 